Now one thing that will affect the acoustic waves is the density of the universe. Yes. Now if you remember, these acoustic waves, you've got the dark matter potential wells and the baryon photon fluid that's falling in and bouncing out. Now if there were no dark matter potential wells, this would just be a sound wave like the ones moving around this room right between us. Yes. So things would just go in and out, in and out, and the in oscillations and the out oscillations would be the same. Yep. But if you've got dark matter, and you also have to have baryons mixed in with the photons fall down, if it's pure photons falling in, they don't have much mass. But if there are baryons mixed in, then when they're going into a potential well, gravity is assisting them, so they'll go yep. faster. But when they're coming out, they're climbing up a hill, and suddenly when I'm climbing up a hill, I go much slower than when I'm going down. And so what you'd expect is an imbalance. The oscillations where they fall in would be fast and dramatic, and the ones where they go out would be a bit more drawn out and more pathetic. Yep. And this will affect the different peaks. So for example, this is the first acoustic peak, and this is where the matter's just had time to fall, and these are lumps so big that things have only just fallen in over the age of the universe at that point. But here yep. is the second peak, and here they've fallen in, bounced and come out. So we're actually picking up when they're in between the dark matter lumps. So this one is falling in, that one's going out, and we'll keep on going all the way down yep. here. In, out, in, out. So what you'd expect is if there's a lot of dark matter and particularly a lot of baryons, you'd expect the odd numbered peaks, so one, three, five, and so on, to be enhanced, because that's where you're falling into the, the dark matter potential wells, and the even number ones to be weakened because that's when you're bouncing out. But of course it is a ratio a little bit between how much baryons there are and how much dark matter there is. So it's a little bit complicated. Yes, and also if you have more dark matter that means the lumps are bigger to begin with and so things are going to start off oscillating more. So it's a rather complicated thing. But it is all nice linear physics which means it can be calculated very precisely. And here once again are some simulations showing what's going on here. So this is a barometer, so this is omega baryon, so that's what fraction of the universe is baryons. And so we, are, we, have, we actually have omega matter here as well. We just keep that value at a constant value. And we see what happens as we add more and more baryons to the universe. And you can see that this, uh, this, this curve, for example, comes up and the second one goes down. So the reverberation drops and the compressions go up. So. And if you change instead the total amount of matter? Right. So in this case, uh, we're keeping the amount of baryons fixed, and we're just going to make more and more dark matter in this case. And so you can see that uh, as you go through and make the universe heavier and heavier, you get these, these um, curves actually drop uh, in their overall fluctuation strength. And by fitting the detailed shape of these curves, you can learn Omega matter, so all matter, dark baryons, is about 31.5% of the critical density of the universe. Yes, and this is from the Planck experiment, uh, the best experiment we have at this point. And then the other thing we can measure out is how many baryons, or the atoms we're used to. And look at this exquisite precision that we can do that with 0 0.048 and then three zeros and a five as the uncertainty. Remarkable. I would have never thought we could have done anything this well. And this is pretty much agreeing with what we learnt from the primordial nuclear synthesis that told us that about this amount from the deuterium to hydrogen ratio had to be in the form of baryons, but most of the mass in the universe could not be in the form of baryons. And so we've got two totally independent lines of evidence, one from nuclear reactions in the early universe and element ratios, and one from wiggles in the microwave background, and they're giving us the same answers. Yeah, well that usually is a good sign you understand things very well. Yes, and this number here is also agreeing fairly well with what we measured from looking at galaxy clusters and large-scale structure and peculiar motions, and also from weak gravitational lensing. So these all seem to be telling us that the matter we see in these clumps on very large scales is about all the matter there is. Yeah, and I should say uh, that there's still a little bit of controversy over this number especially, because the two satellite experiments, WMAP that just finished, and Planck, which is finished as well, but still under analysis, there's a little bit of question about how the background's removed. And so the uncertainty in this may be just a little bigger than the number here. We'll see. I think time will tell us. So combining all these model elements, you can get a really remarkably good fit to the data. So the, the points here are the data, and the red line is the model with the parameters we've just been talking about. And really, I mean, it's a very complicated shape, 
And yes. it does an extraordinarily good job. Yeah, and essentially whenever you can predict something in advance that well, there's really no way around it. And this model has, you know, baryons in it, fine. We know about those on Earth. It has mat omega matter, dark matter. So you need to have that in there as well. And it turns out it needs to have the cosmological constant or the whole thing would be shifted in a different direction. So it really does bring together this crazy universe, 95% of which we don't understand, but you can predict exactly what you see in the universe. If you want to come up with a rival theory of cosmology, you've got to be able to explain this to this level of precision. That's a very, very tall order. Yes. There is one anomaly here, or possible anomaly, up here on the very large scales, the so multiples in the 20s. The, both the WMAP data <coughs> and the, the Planck data were a bit low over here. You can see it's yeah. a bit down there. And remember, this is the part of the universe where this part of the universe and this part of the universe are much longer wavelengths than sound can travel. So this is what the universe was effectively born with after inflation. So for whatever reason, it appears that we're just, the quantum fluctuations seem to be missing on that scale compared to what you expect at other scales. But the problem, of course, is that's 20 degrees, so you don't get very many of them across the sky, which ultimately means there's a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty we're never going to be able to get around because we only live in one universe, and the universe only has so many of those scales across it that we can yeah, see. Yeah, the error bars here are simply because we were in one place in the universe. We'd have to move 10 billion light years and take another picture, then another 10 billion light years and take another picture, and that would give, be able to bring down the statistics here, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that the uncertainty here is, it, well, the... I would say the unusualness here is about 5% of universes you might expect something this anomalous. So it's not horrible, 1 in 20, but it's sort of in that very uncomfortable place where you feel like you're missing something. Yeah, so maybe this is a clue to something new and strange going on, or maybe it's a 1 in 20 fluke. Yep. I wouldn't walk across a bridge that had a 1 in 20 fluke chance of collapsing under me, so I wouldn't, wouldn't bet the farm on that. But it, maybe it's suggestive, but how we're actually going to pursue this further, I don't know. No, it's not easy. I'm kind of hoping someone on the other side of the universe has beamed a message, a picture of the cosmic microwave background from their perspective, and it'll be coming in at some point in the near future when the universe was much younger from their point of view. So anyway, these are the amazing results we get from the cosmic microwave background and isotropic peaks, acoustic peaks. But there is, this is a gift that keeps on giving, there is actually more to learn from these acoustic peaks, which is actually how they're imprinted on the universe that we see right today.